Hey, what's going on everybody? Samuel Kim here, and today I wanted to talk to you about L&M Fine Jewelry. The L stands for Landy, the M stands for Michael, and the AM stands for their son, Carson, or as he jokingly says, it stands for Carson. Um, it's a family-owned jewelry company. It's your diamond destination. I know it's my destination. I went there to get my fiance's engagement ring. They took great care of me. Their customer service is amazing. They're very attentive to what you need and what you're looking for, and they know exactly how to get you that. And also, their communication is tough top notch. They take great pride in taking good care of their customers. They took great care of me and my fiance every time we went in there. Great smiles on all their faces. They do a great job. If you're in the Missoula area or even if you're in the state of Montana, you have to drive over to Missoula. Come to L&M Fine Jewelry. Get that ring for that special person. It's your diamond destination. What's going on everybody? Samuel Kim here and I'm back with another one. Today, I got a great video for you guys today. One of my favorite topics that we're going to be talking about today is some of the top returning receivers in the Big Sky Conference for the 2024 season. We'll also be, I'll be reacting to some of the Mount Rushmores. So good old Grizzlies posted a tweet talking about who would you have on your Mount Rushmore as a coach or a player at the University of Montana. And uh, there were some interesting answers, so I'll be looking at that. Um, we're also going to talk about athletic ability at the FCS level as compared to the FBS level. Got a really interesting topic there. Um, Tommy Malott or Cam Miller. Um, I know that Sam Herter dropped his top 25 returning quarterbacks. We're also going to be looking at that list, but there was an interesting discussion going on between Tommy Malott and Cam Miller that I wanted to talk about as well. Clifton McDowell tweeted out that if he was healthy for the whole national championship game, he would have, they would have won. I'm going to give my thoughts about that. And then we're also going to be looking at the Hero Sports Top 25 preseason poll. Um, so, yeah, make sure you guys hit the like. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Leave me a comment down below. And we will get straight into the video. Okay. So, first things first. My top returning receivers in the big sky. I'm going to be starting at number 10 and going down to number one. A lot of this is predicated on stats. A lot of this is predicated on like who's return, like obviously who's returning. Like there was a couple of guys who transferred out who probably would have made this list. But at number 10, there's, and there might be some surprises. Honestly, three of the receivers on this list are at Idaho State. And three of the receivers, obviously, are at Montana. So two schools who have a lot of talent at the wide receiver position. Um, we'll see where they ended up on the top 10. But at number 10, we have Alfred Jordan Jr. for Idaho State. He had 44 receptions last year, 479 yards, three touchdowns. Um, obviously, he was their fourth receiver last year. You got Chayden James, who's on this list. Christian Fredrickson, who's on this list. And then you would have had Cyrus Wallace, but I believe he was a senior and he graduated. So we have Alfred Jordan Jr. from Idaho State coming in at number 10. Um, I think he's somebody who obviously has the skill set to be great. I think he should be like their third receiver this year, um, unless things have changed with Chayden James and Fredrickson. But I think he has a lot of talent. He's got a lot of ability. I think he has the ability to be a star in that offense. I mean, they throw it all over the place. They had two receivers over 700 receiving yards, um, one over 1,000 receiving yards. They had a bunch of receptions. They throw it all over the place. Um, Alfred Jordan should be primed to have a better year than he did last year. I mean, he had 500 yards and he was their fourth, he had 480 yards and he was their fourth receiver. So if he can't improve on that in 2024, I don't know what to say. I, I think they've maintained their offensive staff, their defensive staff. So, um, should be pretty good from that standpoint. Number nine, Cal Poly receiver coming in at number nine. I think he might've been the leading receiver, but Giancarlo Woods from Cal Poly, um, he had 50 receptions, 498 yards last year on, and four touchdowns. So he had just about 10 yards of reception. He honestly might have had a little under 10 yards of reception with 50 receptions, 498 yards. So um, probably a guy that's catching a lot of short things, probably not catching a lot of stuff over the top. Um, I know that Cal Poly, honestly, is spreading it out a little bit now as well. They used to run the triple option for a long time. So um, it'd be interesting to see. I know they just lost their quarterback, Sam Heward. Um, he transferred somewhere. I don't know where he tra uh Actually, I do know where he transferred to. I think he went to Utah. Might have been Utah. But I know he just transferred. Sam Heward just transferred away. So they're looking for a replacement for him. But Giancarlo Woods from Cal Poly coming in at number eight. You guys let me know what you think about that. Uh, number nine, I mean, number eight is an Eastern Washington receiver, and it's Noland Ohm 
from Canada, actually. I think him and uh, Keelan uh, know each other pretty well. Keelan White. But Nolan Ohm, 45 receptions, 564 yards, and four touchdowns. So just about around 10 to 11 yards of reception, 45 receptions, 464 yards. Not too bad. Four touchdowns. Obviously, they have Efton Chisholm still there. So two pretty good receivers from them. 560 for him. Almost a thousand. Well, 920 for Efton Chisholm. So two really good receivers at Eastern Washington. Obviously, they had a quarterback come in, I think, at number 18 on Sam Herter's top 25 returners list. So, um, they got a quarterback who can get them, get them the ball. They have some receivers. Obviously, I think the problem for Eastern Washington is their defense. I don't think they ever really struggle putting up points. Um, their problem is always stopping people. Even when they had um, Eric Berrier, their problem always was defense. They weren't able to stop anybody. They're able to put up the points, but they can't stop anybody. So hopefully they're able to get that uh, figured out. I know I was just talking to um, Coulter today, Coulter Nuanez today, and we were talking about, like, I was telling him, like, you know, I watch a lot of film of these Big Sky teams. I watch a lot of their games. Uh, obviously, I do breakdowns, so I watch a lot of those games back, and I get to see a lot of the deficiencies when I'm making these breakdowns, making these cut-ups of, like, what some of the problems with some of these teams are. And it seems like, you know, Portland State, really good running team last year, probably will be the same this year. Eastern Washington, Idaho State can put up points, but obviously can't stop anybody. I think the difference, and then when you look at a Montana State or a Montana defensively, they tackle well. They tackle well. That is the difference between a lot of these better defenses and the defenses that don't really measure up is like being able to tackle uh, well. And obviously we're talking about the receivers, so I'm not going to get on a tangent, but some of these teams on here, they got really good receivers and really good offensive players. And you might wonder like, dang, why aren't they able to get things right um, as a team? And, you know, you look at the defensive side of things, you look at the teams that play good defense, South Dakota State, North Dakota State, Montana, Montana State, they're good tackling teams. The teams that don't do so well are the teams that aren't able to tackle well and, you know, aren't able to stop people defensively. It's not all about tackling, obviously, but I think that plays a big part into it. Either way, we're going to move on. We got number seven on the list, Aaron Fonts from University of Montana. He had 48 receptions, 617 yards, and five touchdowns. Um, he had a really good season last year. Obviously, his breakout season, if you want to call it 600 yards, had a really good season last year. Obviously, I've talked about it multiple times. We all knew he had the talent. We all knew he had the ability, speed, athletic ability. Like, he jumps out the gym, all of it. He does it all well. Just got to put it together. And hopefully this year he's able to put it together for an even better season. But um, he comes in at number seven on my top ten receivers returning to uh, to the Big Sky in 2024. At number six, we got Jared Gibson from Sac State. Um, he was actually their second leading receiver. They had Carlos Hill, who was their leading receiver, who I think I had, who had just over just under 600 or 700 because Carla uh, Jared Gibson had 38 receptions 657 yards for four touchdowns so um bigger play guy making bigger plays down the field not a ton of receptions but decent yardage um, he's returning this year they still got two really good quarterbacks Conklin and then Bennett obviously I think Bennett will probably be the starter coming into the year Conklin will probably split time as well he's a really good receiver but Jared Gibson um he had a they they had some good receivers obviously last year as well Carlos Hill you got Gibson himself, and then you had uh, Marshall, who is gone now. So um, two receivers leaving now. So Jarrett Gibson is probably most likely going to be the guy coming into the fall. We'll see who they brought in through the transfer portal and things of that nature. But Jarrett Gibson, I'll be excited to see what he's able to do this year. Hopefully see if he's able to get over that 800-yard mark, close to that 1,000-yard mark with those two quarterbacks he's got, excuse me, he's got throwing him the ball. But that's number six on the list. We got number four. Excuse me. Coming in at number five on the list is Mr. Junior Bergen from the University of Montana. 59 receptions, 791 yards, and five touchdowns. Really good season for him last year. Um, I, as a receiver, I think he had his breakout season last year. Obviously, we knew what he could do as a returner, but as a receiver, running in that slot, um, finding ways to get open, deep over routes, um, little hitch routes, reverses. I mean, he does it all from a receiver position. He catches all the routes, a lot of sail routes, a lot of deep over routes. But um, he was a really big piece for that Montana offense. Obviously, all three of the receivers for Montana were a big piece of that offense. And I'm really excited to see what he's able to do this year. Hopefully, one of those Montana receivers is able to get over 1,000 this year. But we will see. My Junior Bergen comes in at number five on the list. At number four on the list is Christian Fredrickson from Idaho State. 53 receptions, 791 yards, and five TDs. And you might think, 
So Junior and Christian had the same amount of yardage. Why was one over the other? And the reason I put Christian over Junior was because he had less receptions. Same amount of touchdowns, same amount of yards. He had six less receptions than Junior. So yard per catch average is going to be higher. And uh, I, I appreciate that a little bit more. I don't know. But um, really good receiver, really tall receiver, 6'4", 206 pounds. I'm doing a breakdown on him and Chaden James coming out later this week. But um, really good receiver, got a lot of size. I mean, he, he is, he's a big he's a big body guy. Uh, I, honestly, you don't see him make too many big body catches uh, as a big body guy, but he shows his, his um, catch, catch radius all the time and a lot of the catches that he makes. And then obviously he, he has some really big 50-50 catches that he has. But um, really good receiver, coming in at number four on this list. Number three on our list is going to be our final Montana receiver, Keelan White from the University of Montana, who had 54 receptions, 798 yards, four touchdowns. Um, he had a really good season last year. You could honestly call it his breakout season as well. With the Montana receivers, it's interesting because like all three guys who broke out last year, Aaron Jr. and Keelan, all had played a lot of minutes coming up into the 2023 season, but I don't think any of them had necessarily, I guess Keelan probably, Keelan probably had his breakout season in 2022, but on Junior and Aaron's standpoint, definitely probably in 2024, but even all of them, like, you know, I don't think any of them had got a, a bulk of the targets that they got last year pre, in previous years, so that's, I think, why you saw them all break out last year, but 54 7, 798 yards, just two yards under 800 yards, and four touchdowns for Keelan. He had a really good year last year. Hopefully, they're able to capitalize on that this year. Um, that's probably the biggest strength of the Montana offense coming into this season is their receiver position, their skill position. They got a lot of running backs. They got a lot of receivers. What is their line going to look like, and what is the quarterback going to look like? Those are the questions coming in 2024 for Montana, at least offensively. Um, yeah, but Keelan comes in at number three on the list. At number four, or at number two on the list, from Eastern Washington, it's Efton Chisholm. He had 83 receptions last year, 927 yards, and eight touchdowns. So probably not a super high yards per catch uh, average, but getting a lot of receptions, getting a lot of yardage. He's the number one receiver for Eastern Washington. Like I said when I was talking about Nolan Ulm, um, they have one of the top 25, by Sam's metrics, one of the top 25 quarterbacks coming into the 2024 season. And I'm not saying that to, to poo-poo on Sam. Uh, I respect his opinion, so um, I'm going to take his word for it. Uh, I think it was at number 18 where their quarterback was at. But top 25 quarterback coming into the 2024 season. Hopefully, Efton Chisholm is over, is able to get over 1,000. I don't know if he's had an 1,000-yard receiving season in his career yet, but hopefully he's able to eclipse 1,000 next year. Obviously, they're getting the ball out like they throw the ball all over the place. We saw that under um, when they had EB3 and we see that now. We saw that even before they had Eric Berrier when they had Cooper Cup and all those guys. I mean, they've always been a spread offense, going to throw the ball around all over the place. How do you stop them? But, you know, number two, Efton Chisholm, Eastern Washington, really good season last year. Let's see what he's able to do this year. Somebody I'm going to be paying attention to. At number one on my list is Chaden James of Idaho State. He originally had entered the transfer portal um, right after the season. Um, I don't know if he didn't find a home. I don't know if his recruitment wasn't what he thought. I don't know if, you know, he's he's not the biggest guy. I think he's like 5'8", five, 5'9". Um, not a super big receiver, but he runs good routes. He gets open. Obviously, he gets a ton of receptions, 102 receptions, 1,045 yards, eight touchdowns. I think that works out to be like 10 yards of reception, but still, he's he's making the catches. He's getting the ball out to him. Obviously, it's a lot of short routes, a lot of flats, a lot of unders, but he's making plays when they come his way. Um, yeah, I'll be excited to see what he's able to do in 2024. If he's able to be the number one receiver in the conference in 2024, obviously, he's in an offense that, that could – lend itself to that they yeah, get the ball thrown a lot so he should be able to be pretty good in 2024 but we'll see who knows who knows they got a lot of receivers at um idaho state will christian Fredrickson step up to be the guy will alfred jordan step up to be the guy who knows or there could be somebody else who eclipses him as the number one receiver in 2024 but he is the number one receiver returning in 2024 we will see how that turns out this season is there anybody i left out on this list who you guys think should be in my top 10 coming into the 2024 season let me know in the comments down below, and we will move so, on. So, good old Grizzlies last week um, posted a, a tweet talking about, um, let me click on the tweet real quick here. They said, um, who is on your Mount Rushmore of Grizz athletes co slash coaches? Any sport, 
any era. Now, I think mostly people were doing, well, no, actually some people actually did bat like just any sport, any era. And then a lot of people did like football, Mount Rushmore. So I'm going to read some of them off. Uh, these are probably all of the ones that I saw that, these are all the ones that I saw when I checked like two or three days ago. But um, you got Sam Jones, 7619-8262. That's his uh, Twitter at. He said Chase Reynolds, obviously 0809, I think was his time, maybe 10, 11. Um, I don't know exactly when Chase Reynolds graduated, but I know 09, he had like his best season ever. Um, JD Quinn, who I believe was an offensive lineman. You got Croy Bierman, who I believe was a linebacker. And then you have Trumaine Johnson, who was a cornerback. So um, all guys who played in the NFL, um, uh, all guys who were really good, obviously had really good Montana careers. I don't have any problem with that list. Obviously, um, that seems like more of a modern day list, not a, not more of a like a throwback list any era. It seems like they're choosing like that 09, between that 09 and 012 era. I don't know when J.D. Quinn played. I think Croy Bierman actually played a little before then as well. But um, not going super far back because I think if any list, my one thing about a Mount Rushmore for Montana Athletics, I think you have to have Dave Dickinson in there. I think you got to have him in there. I think he's got to be in there. I mean, brought the first national championship to Montana. Obviously, he's not the only person that did that, but he was the quarterback, did a lot for the University of Montana. His jersey is retired. Like, I don't know. I think he's got to be in there. And next list, you got Thrill Hill underscore two, which is Caleb Hill. We used to be a quarterback for the Grizz and had transferred, not transferred, but um, switched positions to tight end before his career was over. Um, he ended up getting drafted, actually, in the MLB draft, real late in the MLB draft, but he did get drafted, I think, was to the Red Sox or the White Sox, one of those teams. I'm not a big MLB guy, so don't quote me on that. Either way, his list was Dave Dickinson, Brock Coyle, Jerry Louis McGee, and Josh Buss. Obviously, I think this is like, his personal Mount Rushmore, I don't think he's a super big Grizz fan. Like, he didn't grow up idolizing the Grizz. He's all the way from Texas. So, I don't know if he knows a lot about Grizz history. I respect the list. He's got Dave Dickinson. I just mentioned Dave Dickinson. He's got Dave Dickinson on there. Brock Coyle, JLM, and Josh Buss. Um, I love Josh. I love Jerry. Obviously, Jerry broke a record. Josh Buss was a dog for the University of Montana. Brock obviously was a dog too, but I think when you think about like a Mount Rushmore, I think it's got to be like guys that, uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. This is, I mean, anybody, you can have anybody on your Mount Rushmore, so I'm not going to be too judgmental, but interesting list there from Caleb Hill. You guys let me know what you guys think about that one. Um, next is we have the Grizz Fan Pod. That's their at on Twitter. Everybody knows who the Grizz Fan Pod is. Their Mount Rushmore is Mike, Luke, Brent, and Kyle. So, um, basically all the hosts of the Grizz fan pod. I know Kyle's not like an official host of the pod, but he's a regular guest on their pod. So um, really cool to see their list. Obviously they're uh, on the Mount Rushmore for a lot of people in uh, big sky pod, big sky pod allure. They're up there for, in the Mount Rushmore. So I'm not mad at that one. Uh, next you have 406 houses. Uh, that's the ad on Twitter. Um, Ryan Featherson, Josh Stuberg, Tony Arnston and Dan Carpenter. Dan Carpenter was a punter. Um, Tony Arnston, I got to believe he's related to Ryan Arnston, probably his dad. Got to believe he's probably a running back. Josh Stuberg, I'm not going to lie. I don't know who Josh Stuberg is. And then obviously Ryan Featherston was a legacy. Um, so yeah, uh, really good, really good list right there from 406 Houses. You guys let me know what you think about that one and we will move on. Kyle Sample, Kyle underscore Sample 6. Obviously the Kyle that I just referred to when talking about the Grizz fan pod, his Mount Rushmore was Rob Selvig, basketball legendary women's basketball coach, Don Reed, the coach that brought the first national championship to the University of Montana, Dave Dickinson, the quarterback of that first national championship team with Don Reed, and then Shannon Kate. I'm not going to lie. I saw I saw Sean. Sean didn't really finish his list, but he had Don Reed, Selvig, and uh, Dickinson on his list. He had floated around with Shannon Kate, but he didn't finish it, so I didn't put his on here. But this was basically, Kyle's list was basically Sean Rainey's list. I don't know who Shannon Kate is. I'm not going to lie. I did not do my research either. I should have looked him or her up. I don't, I, I don't, I mean, Shannon could be a man's name. We know Shannon Schillinger. Like, I don't know. I don't know who Shannon Kate is. You guys, please let me know in the comments who Shannon Kate is. Um, probably a legend at Montana, obviously a legend at Montana, but that's Kyle Sample's list. You guys let me know what you think about that. Those are some of the top, 
uh, obviously all of the Mount Rushmore some from some of the fans. I didn't. I don't know if they had posted this on a Facebook either. I didn't look at Facebook. There are probably a ton of responses on Facebook. I know a lot of Grizz fans are on Facebook. Probably a lot of answers on eGrizz. I'm not on eGrizz, so um, you guys let me know if you guys saw a really good Mount Rushmore. Leave it in the comments, and we will move on. Sure. I can't remember what I was doing when I formulated this list. I can't remember what I was looking at, but I, I was looking. I think I was looking at like. FCS quarterback numbers versus FBS quarterback numbers and I found some interesting I found some interesting numbers when I can't even remember what I was doing I was looking up some statistics I think I was looking up some statistics for like Mark Gronowski or something to compare it to like an FBS quarterback or something but I found these numbers when I so there are 134 FBS schools and there's 133 FCS schools I'm just prefacing this with that I'm just prefacing these numbers with that stat so that you know that like it's pretty even fbs schools and fcs schools are the numbers are pretty even there's one more fbs school than there is fcs schools my question is are the athletes in the fcs less athletic or are the qbs and o-line better at the fbs level or is it a little bit of both let me reread that are the athletes at the fcs level less athletic or are the QBs and O-line better at the FCS level or at, at the FBS level? Or is it a little bit of both? Personally, I think it's a little bit of both. Let me read these numbers to you. So there were 31 1,000-yard receivers in FBS football in 2023. There was 10 1,000-yard receivers in FCS football in 2023. So that's receivers who had 1,000 or more. No receivers who had 99 close to it. You had to have 1,000 or more. There was 10 at the FCS level and 31 at the FBS level. Is that quarterback play or is that better receivers? I don't know. There was 18 1,000-yard rushers at the FCS level in 2023. There was 45 1,000-yard rushers in FBS football in 2023. Is that better offensive lines at the FBS level or is that better running backs at the FBS level or... Uh, is it better athletes? I don't know. We'll move on. There was 33 3,000 plus yard passers in FBS football. So quarterbacks who threw for 30 for 3,000 yards or more. There were 33 of them at the FBS level. There was nine 3,000 plus yard passers in FCS football. Excuse me. So nine quarterbacks at the FCS level in 2023 who threw for 3,000 yards or more. Um, I don't know. I, I I sit back and I, I I'm I, like I said I can't remember what sparked me on this I must have been looking at something of comparison like I think it was just receivers I think I was just looking at the receiver stats and I was like mm, I wonder if it's the same for running backs I wonder if it's the same for quarterbacks obviously we know that FBS football is a is a is a higher level of football obviously we know that like there's better athletes bigger size guys at the FBS level um, especially at the power five level but. I think it's, I should, you know what I really should have done, which this is a misstep by me. I should have looked at G5 numbers, not, I should have taken out the power four numbers and looked at like the G5s compared to the FCS. There's no really rhyme or reason. Like I didn't really have a question in my head when I saw these numbers, but it's just like, is this, are these numbers attributed to better O-line and like quarterback play at the FBS level quarterback because of like, um, the receivers and the passing yards or and or o lines because of the rushing yards or is it that there's better athletes at the fbs level like are fcs athletes less athletic like you see 31 receivers have over a thousand yards that could be attributed at the fbs level that could be attributed to quarterback play or that could be attributed to but i really should have done g5 versus fcs but what do you guys think of this like do you guys think that I personally think it's a little bit of both. And let me explain that. I should have honestly explained that because that's what I said at the beginning. I think it's a little bit of both. I think the quarterback play is better at the FBS level, obviously. I think um, the O-line play is better at the FBS level, obviously. Bigger guys. Um, I, I just think it comes down to size. Size, and, and I've always said this about FBS compared to FCS. To me, it comes down to size in the trenches and then resources. So, like, they get most, like, we didn't get training table at Montana. They get meals provided for them at FBS schools for every meal. Like, they have a designated spot where they can go eat. Like, for us, if we wanted the food zoo, that would be taken out of our scholarship check. For a lot of guys at Power 4 and FBS, even G5 schools, like, that's not something that they have to worry about. There's a meal for them every time they want it. They can go to training table and get a meal. At oh, I remember at uh, Oklahoma State, when my brother went to Oklahoma State, 
they get meals provided for them no matter what. Like training table is always there. That's money that you don't have to spend out of your own pocket. That is a huge plus because there's a lot of guys that don't always eat the right way or aren't always eating when they should be eating at the FCS level. So it's like, it's hard to get the right nutrition. It's hard to, I mean, obviously, and if you want to be great, you're going to do that yourself, but it's easier at the FBS level when they make these things readily available for you. Like these are easy things that you can get to. They don't make it a, a hassle for you to get the right nutrition into your body. I'm going off on the tangent right there. I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's a little bit of quarterback play is a little better. O-line play is a little bit of better. And I think that the athletes at the FCS level are a little not as good. I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't want to poo-poo on FCS players because obviously I was an FCS player. And I never honestly had a 1,000-yard receiving season. I had 800 twice. And then I think I had, six, I had 600 my senior year. So it's like I never had a 1,000 yards. So take what I'm saying with a grain of salt as well. But it's like... Does that is that attributed to quarterback play? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I think there are better quarterbacks at the FBS level. Not that there's not good quarterbacks at the FCS level, but there are definitely better quarterbacks at the FBS level, and there's better offensive lines at the FBS level. So that gives your quarterback more time um, at the FCS level. Obviously, quarterbacks don't have as much time, um, but obviously, like with the you take the running back stat: eighteen a thousand yard rushers in FCS football and 45 a thousand yard rushes in fbs football i think that is 100 like, like that is such a drastic difference 45 there's like 27 more thousand yard rushers at the fbs level than there is at the fcs level i think that is 100 percent. there's a better running backs at the fbs level but also there's better offensive lines 100 percent. like the best offensive linemen always go to the power four always like, you're always going to get the scraps at the G5 and the FCS level. Not that, like, those guys aren't good, but those are guys who are less ready to play now. It's either size-wise, either mentality-wise, or just, like, coaching-wise. Like, they're not ready. They're always getting the made-ready guys who are most ready to play at the Power 4 schools. Alabama's, Georgia's, at the ACC schools, the Michigan's, the Ohio State's. They're getting the guys who are ready right now. You put pads on them, you give them a little coaching, they're ready to go out there for you. So, I I don't know these numbers might mean nothing these numbers might just corrupt like these numbers already tell a story that we already know fbs football i mean but i don't know because like i don't know because i'm not somebody who's just gonna straight up like you see i struggle when i have to say that like there's less at less athletic athletes at the fcs level because i don't 100 i mean i do think that is the case there are better athletes at the FBS level than there is at the FCS level. But like, I'm not trying to downplay the FCS players. It's just, these are interesting numbers. I think they tell a story. I'm trying to figure out what that story is and why that is the case. I would like to see like previous years. I couldn't look at past years on the website that I was on the NCAA website and I, I, I couldn't look at past seasons. Obviously it was just updated January after the, after the FBS national championship game after the college football playoff national championship game. So I couldn't look at like super past years, but I thought it was interesting because there's the same amount of schools, the same number of schools. So why are these numbers, why are these numbers so drastic like that? Like 20 more thousand yard receivers at the FBS level, 25 more thousand yard, 27 more a thousand yard rushers at the FBS level, at the FBS level. And then nearly 23, 24 more 3000 yard passers at the FBS level. Like there's the same amount of, of schools there's one extra school at the fbs level than there is at the fcs level so why such the drastic why is it so drastic i don't know maybe you guys have an answer let me know in the comments and we will move on okay the next thing i wanted to ask um i think i saw culture nuanez talking about this on twitter um it might have been uh he posted he might have posted a snippet on his um on his um on twitter um, I can't remember where I saw this from, but Tommy Malott or Cam Miller, who are you taking? And I want to ask you guys, Tommy Malott or Cam Miller, who are you taking? And obviously, I played at Montana, uh, but no but about it. I would take Cam Miller. And I respect Tommy. I think Tommy's a great athlete. I think when he's throwing and running, he's one of the most dangerous quarterbacks in the country. I think you can put him at number, like, top five when he's throwing efficiently and he's running the ball. We know what he can do with the ball in his hands. But I think the missing piece for him is always, like, what kind of throwing game is he going to have? Is he going to be on as a thrower? Or is it going to be a game where he's not really on as a thrower because we don't always see him connecting as a thrower of the football. His run game is always there. He's got a super strong lower body. He's super fast, super quick. Like, he can do all of that. 
It's about the passing game for me. Cam Miller, the most efficient passer in FCS football last year, probably one of the most efficient passers in college football last year. Like, I'm taking that guy. Pocket passer, national champion, national champion quarterback, like, knows how to win, knows how to run the offense, knows what you, like, great quarterback, great quarterback. I'm taking Cam Miller. Um, I would take the pocket pass. I would take Cam Miller and his pocket passing ability. I'm looking at my notes right here. I would take Cam Miller and his ability to throw from the pocket, um, no matter what that looks like. Like, I respect Tommy. Like I said, I respect Tommy. And I know he can do a hell of a lot with what he what he is as a quarterback. You can do a hell of a lot with him as a quarterback um, in your offense. But I appreciate a pocket passer who can hit open receivers consistently um, more than I do somebody who can run the football. Like if you look back at that last drive for Cam Miller in North Dakota State in the semifinals game when they had to have it to take the game to overtime, like he had it. And this is a game where he's been getting pressured all day. He's been under duress all day. He's not been super accurate all day. And every freaking pass he had to hit on that last drive of the game to take it overtime, he hit it. He hit it. And that, to me, was just like, man. I mean, he he really showed me something there. He really showed me something there in that game. And uh, I, I knew he was a really good quarterback before that game, but that game really solidified it for me where it was like, man, like, no, nah, like, this guy is different. There were some throws in that game where it was just like the placement of the ball was just stupid. And I'll say the same thing about Tommy. If you go back and look at when they played North Dakota State, I think it was in the quarters, um, Tommy was dotting things up, and he was running the ball really successfully. So it's like when Tommy is playing like he is against North Dakota State, Montana State's a hard team to beat because there's nothing you can do with him. You can't – he's going to scramble and find a way to get guys – hit open receivers outside of the pocket, but he's also going to scramble and find ways to make plays with his legs. But also if he can stand in the pocket and dial stuff up like he was in that North Dakota State, North Dakota State game, he's dangerous. I'll say this. I would probably say that Tommy Malott is probably the best returning quarterback in the big sky in 2024. Probably. You got Caden Bennett. Um, obviously you have the quarterback from Eastern Washington blanking on his name right now. Um, but I'm trying to think of who other quarterbacks, like Clifton McDowell left the conference. Um, Giovanni McCoy left the conference. Um, Idaho State's quarterback, I think it was Cook. I think that guy can play, man. I think Jordan Cook can play. Obviously, they didn't play him a lot. You got Sasha Ray at um, Portland State. So you got some quarterbacks in the conference. You got some decent ball uh, people who can throw the ball in the conference. But just with his skill set, Returning this year, I would probably give the nod to Tommy Malott. I think it's between him and probably Caden Bennett um, or the Eastern Washington guy. I haven't watched a lot of a ton of Eastern Washington football, to be honest with you. But um, it's probably between Tommy and Caden Bennett for me, for me personally. And I would give the nod to Tommy Malott. But if I'm picking between Tommy Malott and Cam Miller, I'm taking Cam Miller. The pocket passer, I appreciate a pocket passer over somebody who can... Um, scramble around. I respect that ability, but I don't think that's the end-all be-all for what your ability as a quarterback needs. I need a quarterback who can stand in the pocket and hit open receivers because I, if I'm an offensive coordinator, I need to throw the ball. Like we, And that's the thing. Like I'm not even going to say that. I'm taking Cam Miller. What do you guys think? Who would you guys take between Cam Miller and Tommy Malat? Let me know in the comments and we will move on. Okay. Okay. I thought this was very, very, very interesting. Very interesting. And a lot of people had a lot of things to say in the comments about this, but I wanted to give my two cents about it. I just wanted to give my two cents about it. So Clifton McDowell last week tweeted, I can't remember what day this was. I think it was like, like a Wednesday or a Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, somewhere around there. But he said, FYI, SDSU, South Dakota State, <laughs> had one of the most elite teams in college football, no doubt. But if I didn't get hurt on this play, we win this game. Just saying. And he put the shrug, uh, the shrug, this emoji. The play that he's referencing is a play where he was running towards the goal line and he tried to jump over the offensive, or over uh, like a linebacker and the linebacker hit his shin. And I think the shin injury that he had, shin or knee, whatever it was, ankle, something lower leg injury that he had, that he got during that play, hampered him for the rest of the game. And we could all tell he was kind of hampered. He wasn't scrambling. Like there was times where there was nothing but green grass in front of him and he refused 
to scramble. Um, I think he was really rattled mentally, and I think in, uh, his leg was really hurting him, and he was worried about potentially re-injuring it or worsening it during that game, so he didn't really scramble. Granted, after that play, that was the end of the first quarter. The start of the second quarter, it's a fourth and goal. They go for it. Uh, Eli Gilman gets stuffed on the one-yard line. Miraculous tackle from uh, Bach, Adam Bach. Really good play from him. But um, Eli Gilman did not get in the end zone, So, um, but that's, I mean... That was South Dakota State's defense last year. Like, they were just that good. And I I don't 100% disagree with Clifton. Let me give you my opinion about this. I don't 100% disagree with Clifton. I know what the fans are saying. Obviously, the game was 23-20. to 20. Um, I don't think that's a crazy margin of victory for the team that was wire to wire, the best team in the country. I don't think that's a crazy margin of victory for a team that averaged, I think they gave up nine points a game. Obviously, we only put up three, so... That's right. We helped that average, but Montana helped that average. But um, I don't 100% disagree with him. I don't 100% disagree with him. I think if he is 100% healthy in that game, they definitely have a better chance to win. And I also think that if um, they don't, if they capitalize on these turnovers, one, like it's all if, it's all if, but I, I don't 100% disagree with him. I don't disagree with him. There uh, there was a bunch of times in that game where he could have scrambled following this play, and he didn't. And, and I could tell that something was hurting him. I didn't know what was hurting him, but I could tell he was hurt in some form or fashion. I don't 100% disagree that if he doesn't get hurt, they win the game. Like, I think Montana could have won that game if you have a healthy Clifton McDowell. McDowell. Just think about what made that Montana team so good in 2023 and the offense so good. It was Clifton's ability to run when the play broke down. Clifton's ability to use his legs when things broke down. Clifton's ability to make things happen with his legs. On that play that he's referencing, that all got thrown out of the window. He was no longer able to run the ball. He was no longer able to do things with his legs. He was like, he's no longer able. So that, I mean, that just stands out to me. That really stands out to me. Like, I'm not saying that they would have won, but I don't disagree with, like, I think Montana could have won. I'm not saying they would have won had he not got hurt. Montana definitely could have won. Um, He said, we win this game. I don't 100% agree with that. I think they have a really good chance to win with him not getting hurt. Um, But I don't know. If, just like somebody said in the comments, if, I'm not going to say that, but if, if, he said another if-ism, but I'm going to say if if was a fifth, we'd all be drunk, which is 100% true. Like, we can if all we want. You didn't win the game. And that's my that's another point that I wanted to make about that is like you can if all you want. And I just don't I just don't think you say this right there, right then and like right now. I don't think that's the statement that you want to put out there right now. That like if 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 yes, bro, if. But if isn't what happened. You guys didn't win, you got hurt, you didn't scramble, you stayed. And that's the thing too, is like you got hurt, but you didn't leave the game. You stayed in the game, you continued to play. Uh, we could all tell you were hurt. Obviously. I think he gave us the best. He gave Montana the best chance to win last year. Um, whether he his leg was really hurt or not, I think he gave them the best chance to win in that game. But I think you don't say that right now. Like you just give it some time. Like you give it a few years until you say that. You don't say that a couple months after the game, and then especially after you transferred away and went to a school with McNeese. Like you could have. My point. Another one of my points. I got a lot of points about this. If you truly feel like you should have won that game and you truly feel like if you're healthy, you would have won that game, why not go prove it in 2024? Why leave and go to a school that was 1-10 in 2023, didn't win a lot? I know that you're hoping that you can change things around, and I hope you are too. I believe that you're a difference maker at the FCS level. I think you're a difference maker at the quarterback position. I think in the right scheme, you can do some things at the FCS level, but I think your best chance to do that was in the Coach P's scheme, and you can call me biased, you can call it Big Sky bias, you can call it Montana bias, I think his best opportunity to run it back would have been at Montana, now obviously he made his own decision, I'm never going to fault him for that, he's a grown man, he can do what he wants, but, but like, don't come out and say if I didn't, like, go prove it. Come back and prove it. Come back and make a statement that, like, like I said, if I didn't get hurt, win it. And then say, like I said, if I didn't get hurt, we would have won. But you left. You transferred. You're not at the same school. You might not have the same opportunity to get back to this position that you were in last year. Like, even at Montana, you might not have had the same position. Like, so it's like, you can if all you want, but, like, 
they didn't win. I don't doubt that if he doesn't get hurt, though, they could have won. I will stand by that. I think Montana definitely could have won had Clifton been 100%. Obviously, he wasn't. So now we're ifing, 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 ifing. That's all we're doing is ifing. But you guys let me know what you guys thought about that. SDSU fans obviously disagree. North Dakota State, most fans disagree with this. Whether they're Montana, like most fans outside of Montana, I think really disagree with this. And I think a lot of Montana fans might disagree with this as well. It's like, it's, I don't think it's a great look. And I don't think you say that right now. I know you have immense confidence in your ability. And I think that's something that helped the Montana team out last year was your confidence and your ability and how it permeated through the team. I think that really helped the offensive line. I feel I think that really helped a lot of the young players. Like your mentality is 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 different than a lot. And, you know, sometimes to be great, you have to be different. And I think, you know, that lended itself to your team last year. But I don't like the feel of this tweet, but I don't disagree with you. I don't like you tweeting it, but since you tweeted it, I can give my opinion. I don't think you're 100% wrong. I don't. I don't. But, um, yeah, that is what it is. You guys didn't win, and now we are where we are now. Now you are where you are now. Everybody let me know what you think about that in the comments, and I will move on. Hero Sports. I know I reacted to Sam Herter's um, top 10 FCS preseason poll or FCS preseason last week, but Hero Sports dropped their top 25 preseason poll this week, or last week, and uh, I want to react to it. So I'm looking at it right now. Okay, okay. We are looking at the 2024 Hero Sports preseason top 25 poll. Um, yeah, uh, the Hero Sports FCS staff of Sam Herter, Daniel... Uh, Daniel Steen Kamer and Zach McKinnell of FCS Blue Bloods. Zach McKinnell, FCS Blue Bloods, go follow him. Uh, I don't know if Daniel Steen, Steen Kamer, um, I'm sure he probably has a Twitter, so go follow him on Twitter, but obviously Sam Herter, FCS, go follow him as well, did individual top 25s. Each slot was given a point total, and the three rankings were combined and ordered by total points. So we're going to look at the top 25. South Dakota State at one, North Dakota State at two. You got Montana at three, Montana State at four. Obviously, I think the top 10 is very similar to what we saw last week. The only difference in the top 10 that we saw last week to this week is Chattanooga got number 10 and Central Arkansas is at 11. So I think in Sam Herter's preseason top uh, 10, uh, his preseason top 10, he had UCA at number 10 um, with Chattanooga. I, I didn't even see where he only had the top 10. So he had UCA at number 10. But obviously, Chattanooga was Daniel Steen Kamer and uh, Zach McKinnell's probably number 10. So they won that. Um, I honestly would put Chattanooga over uh, Central Arkansas as well. Um, I know Central Arkansas was decently good in 2023, but they did not win the UAC. Uh, they lost to Austin P in that UAC. And they were obviously, honestly, like neck to neck with like three or other four other teams in that conference. You got Incarnate Word at 12. Richmond, they're leaving the CAA to go to the uh, Patriot League, which is Lafayette, Fordham. Um, uh, Lafayette won that conference last year, but you got Holy Cross, Lafayette, Fordham. Um, a couple of teams in that Patriot League, really good teams in that Patriot League. Lafayette has a really good running back, Jamar Curtis. Watch out for him this year. Almost 1,500 rushing yards last year, 200 carries, bunch of touchdowns dog either way richmond at number 13 you got Furman at 14 um i honestly thought Furman would be hot well i i'm not actually surprised that Furman is at where they are because they did lose a lot of pieces they lost their tight end i think they lost a the receiver i know they definitely lost their quarterback so they're trying to retool up to be able to compete in that socon conference with chattanooga who's at number 10 um no surprise chattanooga is the favorite you got u albany at 15 they lost a lot of pieces as well brevin easton they lost another receiver and then they lost their quarterback poffenberger so um they're trying to retool up west Carolina. I think they have a really good quarterback who's returning. William and Mary at 17. Tarleton at 18. Tarleton, I think, is in that Southland Conference. If I'm not mistaken, they might be in the UAC. Um, I don't have the conferences right in front of me. Delaware, who um, Delaware at 19, who's only going to be in the conference for I think this might be their last year in the FCS before they go to Conference USA um, in the G5. But they're in the CAA where Richmond just left. Lafayette at 20, which is interesting. Um, thought they were a pretty good outfit. UC Davis at 21, Weber State at 22, Youngstown State at 23, and the MVFC. Those previous two, UC Davis, Weber State, and the Big Sky, obviously. Illinois State in the MVFC, and then Eastern Illinois, who I think is in the Southland Conference. Don't quote me on that, but I think um, Eastern Illinois is in that Southland Conference. But yeah, interesting list here. Um, 
Obviously, a lot of MVC, Big Sky at the top. South Dakota, North Dakota State, South Dakota State, North Dakota State, Montana, Montana State, South Dakota, top five, all in the um, MVFC or Big Sky. And then top 10 even, you got a ton of MVFC. One, two, three, four. Let me see. Southern Illinois, which is one. South Dakota, North Dakota State, South Dakota State. Four MVFC in the top 10. Montana, Montana State, Idaho, Sac State. So four and four of MVFC and Big Sky in the top 10. And then you got Villanova at number six. And then Chattanooga at 10. Um, any surprises in here? Do you guys, obviously this is a preseason top 25. So this is where these, these guys think these teams will be ranked in the preseason coming into the season. So obviously this holds a little weight because... I think this this is I mean I think this is judges where they're ranked going into the season for that first week and this judges some of the top 25 games that'll be played in those first uh, that first week but then after that obviously you pivot from that but um yeah I mean interesting teams here um I think we'll see a lot of shake up from this following that first week of the season but I think it's cool to see where they have them ranked coming into the season and uh get some of the fans thoughts on this what do you guys think about this obviously um i think it's pretty interesting how the mvfc and big sky are heavily weighted but i think that's what we see every year i think that's what we see every year um i'm particularly interested in that uac conference with central arkansas austin p is not in this top 25 so um obviously somebody thinks highly of central arkansas i think sam is the guy thinking pretty highly of central arkansas so um, we'll see how that turns out. Tarleton is a really good outfit as well. They've moved up a couple of years ago, so they've been, you know, coming on strong. Western Carolina is probably a dark horse for me in that SoCon conference. They were probably the leading uh, team in that SoCon conference. Well, Furman obviously was like wired and wire in the SoCon conference, but behind them was Western Carolina. They kind of fell off in the back end of the year. So I'll be interested to see Western Carolina. Obviously, that's a team that plays Montana this year in the big sky. So um See how that Western Carolina team is. See how their quarterback play is. See how their defense is. I think, you know, they play really good defense in that SoCon Conference. So, very interested to see how they do um, this year. But you guys let me know in the comments what you guys thought about that top 25. And we will move on. Okay. Last topic I wanted to talk about was the top 25 returning FCS quarterbacks in 2024. Now, this is from Sam Herter. Sam, her, at Sam Herder, S-A-M-H-E-R-D-R-F-C-S. Go follow him. He does great work. Hero Sports is where he posts a lot of his content. Obviously, Twitter is where you can find him, at Sam Herder, F-C-S. Go follow him. Go follow him. Go follow him. Great FCS reporter. He dropped his top 25 quarterbacks in the FCS in 2024, and I'm going to react to it. Um, first off, let's look at number one on the list. Number one, he had um, Mark Gronowski. Obviously, Mark Gronowski, I think his record in the FCS um, is 37-3. and three. One of those losses came when he got hurt to Sam Houston. So you can honestly say he's only lost two games in his FCS career. Absolutely ridiculous. Two-time national champion, back-to-back -back national champion. I have no beefs with him being number one. Number two, you got Cam Miller, North Dakota State, the most efficient passer in college football. I mean, he's ridiculously good. I, I think very highly of this guy as a quarterback. Um... Man, I mean, his passing efficiency is ridiculous. Ridiculous. And you know, they 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 run a very balanced offense at North Dakota State. They pass it and they throw it. They th I mean, they run it. They pass it and they throw it. What am I talking about? They run it and they throw it. They run it very effectively, too, with that power scheme that they run. Um, but they throw it. They I mean, they don't throw it a ton. So the fact that he's the most efficient passer is like... When he's got the ability to pass the ball, he's making the most of it and hitting the receivers when they're open. I mean, I'll say it again. I said it earlier in this video. If you go back and look at that Montana game um, in the semifinals, there was a drive where they had to have it at the end of the game. They had to have it. And what did Cam Miller do after having a not great game from a passing standpoint? He did not have a great game. There was a lot of pressure on him. You could tell he was rattled. His offensive line was a little rattled as well. They had a lot of false starts. Like, it's hard to play at Montana. And he didn't have a great game. But when they had to have it in the fourth quarter with the game on the line, Cam Miller stepped up. That's that championship pedigree. Say what you want about North Dakota State. Say what you want about them losing that game. When they needed to have it, he had it. That's all I got to say about Cam Miller. He's number two. Number three is Western Carolina's quarterback, um, Cole Gonzalez. Um, he, I don't know too much about him, honestly. 
I know he's a really good quarterback last year. I know they were a really good outfit last year. I think they finished eight and three. Either eight and three. I think they only won seven games though, so they might have been seven and four. But they were very close to being a playoff team in 2023. They kind of fell off late in the season. They started the season off super hot. Super, super hot. Um, he was graded as PFF's number 13 FCS quarterback while his passing grade ranked number six. Um, pretty good numbers. Um, his passing efficiency was pretty high at number three. These are numbers that Sam uh, listed off in here. Um, he threw for 2,800 yards, 28 touchdowns, and eight interceptions. And he also rushed for 203 yards. So he's not rushing too much, but really good passer. 204 of 310. 204 passes. 310 passes he completed 204 so i don't have i'm gonna do my calculator real quick was that 70 percent 204 i don't think that's 700 70 percent was that 310 yeah so 65 he completed 65 percent of his passes not bad um i guess he got hurt that's what happened okay I, I knew something happened with that western carolina squad i never i knew something happened so he got hurt in 2024 or 2023 which hurt them obviously really good quarterback yeah I, I like him at number three on this list i did not know he had got hurt um obviously that's on me for not doing my research about the western carolina squad but he got hurt in 2024 um man i i that even makes this that even makes this Western Carolina Montana game even more exciting because it's like knowing that they have a quarterback who's really good in 2023 coming back to 2024. He's number three on this list. Like, man, like whoo, that is a game I cannot wait to see. Montana, Western Carolina, it's gonna be a movie. That is, I think that's going to be a tough test for Montana coming into 2024, for sure. You got C.J. Montez from Fordham at number four. You got Tommy Malott at number five. Corroborating what I said, I think Tommy Malott's the best returning quarterback in the big sky in 2024. Obviously, that's my opinion, and uh, Sam Herter would echo that opinion of mine. He's number five on this list. You got Chase Artopius at Chattanooga. Um, you got Connor Watkins at Villanova. A uh, really good squad, really good defensive squad in 2023. Let's see if they'll be able to be that good in 2024. Paxton De Laurent um, at SEMO at number eight. At number nine, you got Derek Robertson from Monmouth. He's a transfer from Maine. Um, don't know how good Maine was. Uh, Will McIlvain from Central Arkansas originally was at UNI, transferred to Central, Central Arkansas. He's number 10. At number 11, you have the former Texas A&M quarterback, Zach Calzada, U. Uh, from Incarnate Word at number 11. You got Caden Bennett from Sac State at number 12. Probably the second best quarterback, like I said, in the big sky. Um, you got Dean DeNoble at Lafayette. Really good team in uh, at Lafayette. I'll talk about Jamar Curtis every time I hear Lafayette because I think he's a freaking dog. If you've not watched this guy play football, go look him up. Probably one of the leading reasons why they won the Patriot League in 2023. Um, I'm really excited to see how he does in 2024. Uh, Jamar Curtis, but Dean the De Noble, uh, number 13 from Lafayette. You got Pierce Hawley from Eastern Illinois. Um, Jake Wilcox from Brown. And number 15, Kikoa Visperas, Ves Visperas from Eastern Washington. So that's the quarterback at Eastern Washington that I was talking about earlier. Um, Kikoa Visperas, I had originally said 18. He's at 16 on this list. So, so far, three big sky quarterbacks on this list. Um, you got Aiden Bowman. Bauman from South Dakota at number 17. Jamison Wang from Cordell at 18. Kenki Dent from UT Martin at 19. I always mix up UT Martin and UT uh, Chattanooga. I always mix them up. Either way, I'm going to move on. Clifton McDowell at number 20 from Nice. I know this is something that he was not happy about either. I can't remember if I saw this on his Instagram or on his Twitter. But... He was not happy about this at all. He was not happy to be put at number 20 on this list. What do you guys think? Do you guys think he should be the number 20th quarterback? Do you guys think he's higher? I honestly think, I mean, I don't know how Sam is judging these. I don't know if he said, like, give fans idea what they know. Um... I don't. I don't think he said like where if he's ranking them based on passing or throw or running the ball, but 
I honestly would probably put him a little higher. I mean, he did just take Montana to the national championship. I think his throwing ability needs work. I think he needs work on his deep ball. I think he needs work on being able to throw in the pocket and hit receivers. I think that's something he struggles with a little bit. But obviously what he was able to do to empower that Montana squad shines. But him at number 20, I don't know. I might put him at maybe, I don't know though, because a lot of these quarterbacks, I didn't get to watch a ton in 2023. So I don't know how they are as throwers. So honestly, I'm not going to say anything. I think Clifton is right at number 20. I would not argue with that. I think he might, he probably is around the 20th best FCS quarterback. What do you guys think? Do you guys disagree? Do you guys agree? Let me know. Um, at number 21, you got Aiden Sayan from Penn. You got Ryan O'Connor from Delaware at number 22. You got Miles Hastings from UC Davis at 23. Darius, so that's the fourth uh, Big Sky quarterback. You got Darius Wilson from William & Mary at 24. And the fifth Big Sky quarterback, you got Richie Munoz from Weber State at number 25. Um, I th I don't know if he started wire to wire for Weber State in 2023, but um, I'm pretty sure he's the one who finished the season for them. Really good quarterback. I think he was like a freshman last year too, so um, hopefully he's able to be better in 2024 with what he was able to do in 2023. I know Weber State has been one of the staples in the big sky for some time, and they kind of struggled last year to find their footing. So really interested to see how uh, Weber State bounces back and how um, Richie Munoz does in 2024. Will they be a sleeper, a dark horse in the big sky in 2024? Who knows? I mean, I think I think the big sky is kind of up in the air in, in 2024, besides like the Montana and Montana State. I think some of the teams who are going to challenge for the supremacy in the Big Sky are kind of up in the air. It could be SAC. I think it could be NAU, potentially. I think they played the conference pretty tough in 2023. So I think in 2024, I expect decently good things from them in 2024. Um, but really, it's SAC, Idaho, and then, you know, Montana and Montana State. So we will see. We will see. What do you guys think about this list? Um, I think Cole Gonzalez is somebody to watch for 2024, knowing that he got hurt in 2023. I think he's somebody who, you know, could really shine in 2024. They have a decent schedule that, you know, might put them in front of the masses in 2024 as well. So if he shows out that he could be a guy who potentially could win Walter Payton Award, the Walter Payton Award. I mean, it just depends on how he plays and how his team ends up in 2024. But what do you guys think about Sam Herter's list? These are my reactions to this list. Obviously, a lot of Big Sky guys on there. You got, um, let's see how many uh, MVFC guys are on here. One, two, the top two are Missouri Valley guys. And then you got three, only three Missouri Valley quarterbacks on here. You got the South Dakota guy, Aiden Bauman, who's the other guy. But only three MVFC quarterbacks on here. Um, pretty surprising. But the two top guys are the guys in the con in the subdivision. You got Cam Miller and Mark Gronowski. So what do you guys think about this list? What do you guys think about uh, Sam Herter's top 25 returning quarterbacks? Is there somebody that he missed? Did he miss your guy from your school on this list? You let me know in the comments. Um, I will be sure to read all of them. I always read the comments. Thank you guys so much. But um, yeah, that is going to conclude my video for today. I appreciate you guys for tapping in. I thank you guys for um, all the great questions that you guys always ask me. I know once again, I didn't ask for questions. I didn't ask for um, subscriber questions. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've been slacking. I know. But um, I think I covered a lot of good topics today. You guys let me know in the comments what you guys think about that. Make sure you leave a like. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Subscribe, 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 please. It means the world to me. I've been creeping up on that 1300 subscribers number so really excited about that really excited to get to 1300 subscribers you guys help me get there but uh make sure you subscribe make sure you like the channel leave a comment down below let me know and i will see you guys next week thank you so much catch you later